Hello, I'm John Sargent and welcome to Argumental, the show where the hottest names in comedy debate the biggest issues facing mankind. Issues like if our universe is ever expanding, how am I ever going to find a pair of trousers that fits? <laughs> Does the BBC hate all women or just the old ones? <laughs> and why can't I find a newspaper to publish my hilarious cartoon strip about the crazy adventures of Mohammed? <laughs> Here to argue such burning issues and others like them are our teams. In the red corner with Marcus Brigstock, this week, it's Jack Whitehall. <laughs> and joining Rufus Hound in the blue corner, please welcome Stephen K. Amos. Okay, let's start with round one, where we debate a big issue that affects every last one of us. That's right, even you, Jeremy, in Manchester. I'm watching you, Jeremy. Don't make me come round there. <laughs> Tonight, the subject under discussion is chickens. Chicken. Before they're delivered in buckets and caressed by the Colonel's special coating, they're living, breathing creatures like these. Who knew? Put them on the conveyor belt, the grinder, whee! Factory farming might not be everyone's cup of growth hormone, but surely being able to eat, sleep and cluck without even having to get up means chickens are the luckiest animals on earth. Is it really worth getting in such a flap about? The issue I want the team to argue over is this. There's nothing wrong with battery farm chickens. Proposing this statement on behalf of the red team, it's Marcus Brigstone. Look at that happy chicken. Battery and happy. That's what they like, ladies and gentlemen. Chickens are like prostitutes. <laughs> you know, of course you can pay a lot of money for a gorgeous, clean-looking one, but I think we all know you'll have a better time with one that's cheap and dirty and has unnaturally massive breasts. <laughs> Listen, what this argument boils down to is this, ladies and gentlemen. They're chickens. Fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? Flightless balls of meat on delicious legs and they sweat gravy. What's not to like? <laughs> Who cares about chickens? We have to have battery chickens anyway. There isn't enough space in the UK to have free-range chickens. We'd have to move to France and just hand this country over to chickens. <laughs> sure, some of them are deformed. They have three legs. Mmm, an extra leg! <laughs> Brilliant! Who cares about them? No one, no humans care about chickens. We made a film about chickens, Chicken Run. We care about them so little, in the lead role, we cast the famous anti-Semitic, god-bothering drunk driver, Mel Gibson. That's how we give a shit about chickens. <laughs> give a man a fish, he will eat for a day. Teach him how to fish, he'll eat forever. Give a man a two-pound battery chicken, then give him another one. They're that cheap. You can just keep on giving him and he'll eat forever. Ladies and gentlemen, they're delicious. I know it, you know it. Vote red. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. OK, next up, opposing the statement and saying there are a lot of things wrong with battery farm chickens, it's Stephen K. Amos. Yes. Uh, battery chickens are very, very cheap, right? You can buy them for £1.49 for a whole chicken. Now, I can't get it out of my head, right? From an egg, onto a truck, into a freezer, and onto my plate, for £1.49, you can't even post a chicken for that. <laughs> if I wanted to eat something that had lived in squalid conditions without washing, I'd eat a student. <laughs> People keep chickens as pets, don't we all? Imagine this, ladies and gentlemen, your cock being forced into a cramped, dark space with already full of uh, about 12 other cocks. <laughs> Would you eat it? I wouldn't. <laughs> what I propose, ladies and gentlemen, is to find maybe a happy animal in a field, then go up to it and kill it. <laughs> <laughs> I do believe this, I really do. <laughs> but chickens are always up for a fight. <laughs> and so am I. 
<laughs> so I'll take on their cause, ladies and gentlemen. If you know right from wrong, you must follow the blue team and say, there's everything wrong with battery farm chickens. So please, vote blue. So thank you, Stephen. Is there anything you want to add? Mark, as you've already told us, you don't even eat chicken. Okay? It yeah. doesn't mean yeah. I don't want them kept in cramped conditions, Stephen. <laughs> That's what I want, though, from the chicken. When you read on a chicken and it says, you know, like, this chicken has had a better life than me. That is yeah. not what I want from my chicken. <laughs> I want to pick up that chicken and feel good about myself. I want to pick it up and say, this chicken was bullied and abused for every day of its natural life. <laughs> and on its last day on this planet, it was taken out to a field and then it was raped by a farmer. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Show me the chicken that's had a better life than you. <laughs> and I urge you to call social services and have yourself removed from your house. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you all. So, is there anything wrong with battery farm chickens? It's time for the studio audience to decide who made the best case. Hold up your red card if you agree with Marcus. He thinks there's nothing wrong with battery farm chickens and loves his cock in a tiny box. <laughs> and hold up your blue cards if, like Stephen, you prefer to get your cock out in a field. <laughs> For Marcus and Jack, and blue for Stephen and Rufus. Vote now. So, that looks like a victory for the blue team. Well done, Stephen and Rufus. They've convinced our audience that battery farm chickens are very wrong. Delicious, but wrong. <laughs> After 12 months, a hen's egg-laying ability starts to decline, but it's fine, as these days, they can have their eggs frozen while they concentrate on their career. <laughs> the discovery of vitamin D meant that you can keep something indoors with no sunlight. Bad news for chickens, great news for goths. <laughs> Right, next up is slideshow. One member of each team will again be debating a controversial issue, but this time I want them to illustrate their argument using a series of pictures which they've never seen before. Rufus and Jack, you're up for this one. Rufus, I'd like you to start by arguing that facial hair on men is never attractive. <laughs> Here's your first picture. Look at me. Look at my face. What a disgrace. Brad Pitt, you impressed no one. <laughs> Many people have had to introduce their own facial hair policy. <laughs> That's why the Brazilian has taken off in such a big way over here. No lady wants to glance down at an obliging gentleman friend and find that whilst it was Brad Pitt that went down, it's now David Bellamy who's doing the licking. <laughs> <laughs> it's not always terrible, is it? <laughs> Although it isn't something of a male curse to have this stuff growing out of your face. I mean, I've even started taking hormone replacements to stop it from happening. Uh, it hasn't got rid of my tash, but my clitoris is enormous. <laughs> <laughs> ladies are meant to be scared of facial hair. It's meant to terrify. So amongst that fear, ladies, comes the forbidden. A simple moustache, yes, but also an open invitation to a night of sweaty abandon with a minotaur. <laughs> because I don't care if you're dopey, grumpy or sleepy. <laughs> Tonight, I'm going to get funky with my unattractive moustache. <laughs> Thanks, Rufus. Jack, I'd like you to argue the opposite, that facial hair on men is always attractive. Yes. Here's your first picture. Facial hair on men is always attractive, as is facial fluff. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but there's things that a beard can say about a man as well. You see a beard, it tells you a lot about him. As my next slide will show, it can show that a man can be soft, caring, loving, cuddly. <laughs> <laughs> 
wearing black and white with Stalin, that he was just a nasty megalomaniac dictator. Actually, he did have a softer side, because he was a nice man on the inside, but a powerful man as well. And facial hair shows that you've got power. Case in point, Dragon's Den, that one that sits next to all the money stroking their beard, looks very powerful, you know, a Deborah Meaden. <laughs> Everyone wants to grow facial hair, but not everyone has the ability to grow facial hair. There was always uh. that one at school. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Some people can't do it. People like Marcus, because he was one of those people at school that couldn't grow the beard. Correct me if I'm wrong, there was always one, wasn't there, in the shower that was showing off because they already had stubble and they had more pubes than everyone else. At my school, all right, it was the art teacher, Mr. Fabra, but the point still stands. <laughs> is an issue because Rufus said yeah he's not sexy with the bit but I I beg to differ I think Rufus is one hell of a man <laughs> Marcus just looks like an idiot but I'd love to be like you're a real man with hair on his lip I just want to oh, kiss that hair in your face a real man with manly hair on your face and I want to be like you're a proper man and a proper I've man a like Stephen with hair on his face a proper actual man like you <laughs> Okay, that's quite a scary beard, a beard of bees. But a beard can be sinister, but sinister in like a sexy way. It makes someone look dangerous. I mean, like the gentleman here, come up. Can, let me sh can we show the people your beard? Because you have a beard. Look at this man's beard. When he walked in, we all thought there is a sinister man. There is a man with the look of a man that has the ability to soundproof a cellar. And I mean that in a nice way. But this is a manly man, a proper manly man, probably with a manly name as well. What's your name? Don't let me down. What's your name? Rob. Rob. Yes, Rob! <laughs> a, name, a name from the soil, Rob! What do you do, Rob? Do you have a man's trade as well? What do you do? Don't let me down. What I do work do? in IT. You work in IT. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down, you've let me down. <laughs> <laughs> but a beard is manly, that is my point. And that <laughs> is why you should vote for the red team. Jack, Marcus and Stephen, would you like to pitch anything into this debate? I'd like to go back to one of the pictures, picture of Marcus. I cannot be the only one thinking Osama. <laughs> <laughs> if you put that particular beard on anybody, that is the Osama beard. I mean, wrong. I'm gonna, I'd like to make a beard now and hold it up on people at random in the audience. Yeah. <laughs> you carry on amongst yourselves, I'll make a quick Osama beard. <laughs> Here we go. Let's, put, let's give this a go. It's a little nose holder. <laughs> little mouth hole. Someone's done this before. <laughs> that looks like a glory hole. <laughs> 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 On my face. <laughs> well, here goes, Marcus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so I don't know what. Okay, thank you. So, is a man's hairy face a thing of beauty? It's time for our studio audience to decide who made the best case. It's a red card for Jack, who says yes, and a blue card for Rufus, who says no. Vote now. <laughs> a clear victory for the Reds. Well done, Jack. You've convinced the audience that facial hair on men is always attractive. Some people say that men with beards have something to hide, and they do, an ugly face. <laughs> Many women hate moustaches, which is why it's so surprising that lesbianism was invented in Greece. <laughs> Join us after the break when we'll be finding out whether kissing is cheating and if having a famous parent makes you a celebrity. Don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back to Argumental, the show that demonstrates that if arguing were an Olympic sport, Britain would still probably come fourth. <laughs> our next round is called Flip Flop, where we find out how well our teams can argue with themselves. I'm going to give one member of each team a statement which they must support until they hear this sound. At which point, they must perform a U-turn and argue against it. Then flip flop backwards and forwards every time I press the buzzer. Marcus and Stephen will play this one. Marcus, you're up first. I'd like you to start off by arguing that kissing isn't cheating. Right. 
There we go. Ladies and gentlemen, kissing isn't cheating, particularly if you're playing Monopoly. <laughs> but kissing isn't cheating in a marriage anyway, is it? Because it's only kissing. It's just a little bit of kissing. And uh, that's... That's filthy. And if <laughs> I were caught doing that, I would fully expect my wife to string me up by the bollocks, because is that an OK way to behave? Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> it is, because she knows I enjoy being strung up by the bollocks and that kissing <laughs> is not cheating. It's fine. The kiss of life. People give each other the kiss of life, don't they, when they're in danger or when someone's attractive and you go, oh, sorry, I thought you looked a bit peaky and you can just leap on them and go for it. And uh, <laughs> It's cheating, though, isn't it? Rescuing someone like that if you're married is absolutely out of order. If you see someone recently pulled out of a swimming pool and you're married, I'm afraid you just simply have to watch them die. <laughs> That's not the way that it works. Uh, Kissing is not cheating ever, unless it's on the genitals. Then... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we're talking about <laughs> genital kissing here. Uh, I think that is cheating and so is facial kissing. <laughs> the French kiss each other, don't they? Whenever they meet each other, they kiss on both cheeks. And yet we call French kissing an arrangement where you basically smash your faces together and try and lick some sick out of each other's throats. <laughs> and that is cheating, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you, Marcus. Well, flip-flop. I used to enjoy playing Kiss Chase at school until a month ago when I was caught on CCTV and had to move away from the end. <laughs> OK, Stephen, you're up next. I'd like you to begin by arguing that the Brits aren't drinking enough booze. <laughs> Us Brits are not clearly drinking enough booze, and I'll tell you why. Forty pubs a week are closing. The knock-on effect of that is that people will lose their jobs, their livelihoods. Britain is also a very tiny country. Uh. It, and, and to make it bigger, we need to go to France for those booze crews. <laughs> Bring them back so we do continue drinking more booze. <laughs> there are people sitting here around this, this set here with glasses. What's in their glasses? You think it's water. It's gin. We're all completely and utterly twatted. We're half our faces. Half the audience, you're twatted too? Yeah. Did you hear that? That's disgusting. <laughs> you should be ashamed of yourselves. What will drinking do to you? It'll make you slap children, punch them in the face. I think it's a really great idea. <laughs> so why don't we all join together, have a drink, go outside tonight and punch a child in the face. <laughs> Oh, good that be. <laughs> well, done, well done, Stephen. I've cut down on my alcohol intake after I discovered it was making my hands too shaky to light my crack pipe. <laughs> <laughs> OK, time for the studio audience to decide who flipped and who flopped. If you thought Marcus flip-flopped best about the ins and outs of infidelity, then vote red. But if you thought Stephen flip-flopped best about British boozing, then raise a glass to blue. So it's red cards for Marcus or blue cards for Stephen. Vote now. <laughs> Very nicely done, everybody. Very nicely Let's done. Let's go to the pub! <laughs> <laughs> so, a blue majority there. Commiserations to Marcus, but congratulations to Stephen. It's on to our popular culture round. Tonight's debate is all about celebrity offspring. Famous kids, the key to success has always been who you know, not what you know. But until recently, you did have to know someone apart from your own dad. Every lunk wants to be famous these days, but does falling out of clubs, cars and dresses really count for talent? But it's not all harmless fun and games. Sometimes it can lead to this. Kids beware, if you keep banging on about daddy, before long, they'll nail you for it. <laughs> Celebrity kids there, but the statement I want our teams to argue is this. Having a famous parent does not make you a celebrity. First up, it's Jack. <laughs> okay, right, so I want to start with a quick disclaimer. 
the moral bankruptcy amongst people like this is not their own fault. Because fact, celebrities do not make good parents. Case in point, the Celebrity Mother of the Year Award, which two years in a row, 2006 and 2007, was awarded first to Kerry Katona, and then the following year to Jordan, a.k.a. Katie Price, look at me! <laughs> giving that award about as much legitimacy as the best dad in the world mug which sits proudly on Joseph Fritzl's mantelpiece. <laughs> I would admit, sometimes there are anomalies. There are, you know, take for example some of the acting dynasties where you see it can be good, it can be successful. Kirk Douglas was a brilliant actor, as in turn was his son, Michael Douglas. As in turn was Michael Douglas's daughter, Catherine Zeta-Jones. <laughs> it can be a good thing, but most of the time it's not. Take people like Paris Hilton. Paris Hilton is famous because her dad is what? The owner of the Hilton Hotels. Do we even know what Paris Hilton's dad looks like? You wouldn't know him if he walked down the street. So why is she a celebrity and Barry Travel Lodge isn't? It's ridiculous. <laughs> you have to vote for my team tonight because not only should you vote for them, but it is your duty to vote for them because it's our fault that these people get attention. It's our fault that they have the oxygen of publicity which they so desperately crave because that's why they crave it. They crave attention because they didn't get attention when they were children because they were trapped in hellhole celebrity families where daddy made loads of money in the 80s and didn't work for a day for the rest of his life and then neglected <laughs> some that nobody ever paid attention to nobody ever wanted to listen to and now he's been forced to chase his own life of fame and fortune and use his fleeting television appearances as a desperate cry for his dad's attention <laughs> tonight with a quote from a famous celebrity father, Bob Geldof, and that is that every time I click my fingers, the child of a celebrity does something irritating, futile, and utterly, utterly pointless. <laughs> Well done. Next up, opposing jacket, Rufus. He's arguing that having a famous parent does make you a celebrity. Yeah. Thanks. Now, Kelly, congratulations. You've had a number one single with your dad. <laughs> Who here is proud of anything they've ever done with their dad? Thank you. <laughs> Kimberly Stewart over there at the far end is actually here tonight, so thank you, Kimberly. Sorry <laughs> for making you stand next to these two cardboard cutouts. <laughs> Kimberly's actually launched a clothing line, I don't know if you know this, called Pinky Starfish. <laughs> Drink that in. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but if you name your clothing line after a euphemism for vagina, don't be surprised if people think that if they wear your clothes, they'll look like a twat. <laughs> partly because of the name, Kimberly, but also partly because you designed it. <laughs> and Peach is there in the middle. Well, that's not even a name, is it? Alison or Alexandra, that's a name. Peaches is what you call... Peaches. <laughs> If you're Bob Geldof's daughter, then there are three million loyal sun readers who want to see you fuck it all up. <laughs> they crave the knowledge that despite your money and your privilege, you're still nothing more than a shitty freckle on the underpants of existence. <laughs> Everybody in this room has an instant or several from their formative years that they'd rather nobody knew about. I've got that canal boat holiday when I decided to go punk. Uh, Jack has his embarrassing heterosexual blunders. <laughs> Marcus has his Marillion tapes, but uh, <laughs> you just be grateful that your surname's not Osborne or Magley, otherwise we'd all know. Kimberly, Kelly, Peaches, we need them. And for that reason, if for no other, I urge you all, vote blue. Thank you. Thanks, Rufus. Marcus and Stephen, would you like to add anything in support of your teammates? I'd like to ask who the three people are in here. <laughs> <laughs> who here doesn't know who at least one of these people is? OK, thank you. And who here amongst you who does know who they are wish that you didn't? <laughs> okay. Kimberly doesn't want to hear this. <laughs> 
Right, thank you all. So, does having a famous parent make you a celebrity? Once again, the studio audience will decide who made the best case. It's a red card for Jack and Marcus, who think Peaches Geldof should get a proper job, and a blue one for Rufus and Stephen, who think having a famous mum and dad is a free pass to stardom. Vote now. Oh, my friend. <laughs> you get two votes for the pregnant lady. So, it looks like a win for the Reds. Well done, Jack and Marcus. They convince the audience that having a famous parent does not make you a celebrity. Having Bruce Willis and Demi Moore as parents certainly hasn't harmed Rumor Willis's acting career. What's harmed her career is having a face like an anvil. <laughs> Lily Allen, Peaches Geldof, Miley Cyrus, they all have something in common, but the question is, do I want to sleep with them? <laughs> <laughs> so at the end of that round, both teams are absolutely level. <laughs> Time now for the final round and a last chance for our teams to show just how argumental they really are. I'm going to show them a series of images. All they have to do is to suggest what argument the picture is proving. OK, here's the first one. Is it the argument for them trying to find replacements for Bruce Forsyth and Len Goodman on Strictly Come Dancing? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an argument that last of the summer wine has gone on too long. <laughs> it's not only an argument against a thorough search of Neverland. <laughs> OK, next picture. An argument against disabled people being allowed to park that close to the checkout. <laughs> this is an argument against unknown item in the bagging area. <laughs> um, an argument against overreacting when you've been caught with six items in the five or less <laughs> checkout. Next picture. Oh, wow. this, this is an argument against the Queen being allowed to show strangers what Prince Philip offered to Barack Obama the first time they met. <laughs> <laughs> this is an argument for being able to hear the Queen at all times, because I reckon she's saying, if you don't stand up in my presence, I'm going to ram this banana up your arse. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's it. So it's the final time. It's down to our studio audience to decide who made the best case. Red for Marcus and Jack, and blue for Rufus and Stephen. Vote now. So I can tell you that the red team have won the round, which means this week's winners are the red team. Well done, Marcus Brigstock and Jack Whitehall. Commiserations to Rufus Hound and Stephen K. Amos. That's all we've got time for. Good night. And Jack Whitehall shows off his stand-up skills in his hometown this Sunday night at 10 in Dave's brand-new one-night stand. <laughs>